Hello everyone, my name is Karina Grzech. I'm a postdoc at the University of Valencia in Spain. And today I will be talking about Ecuadorian experiences in collaborative language documentation. First of all, let me tell you a little bit more about why I'm interested in this topic. So as you all know, language documentation and conservation has taken a collaborative turn a while ago. We've started talking about how to make our projects collaborative and work jointly with uh, speaker communities. But when you look at the literature, it's not exactly clear always what collaborative research really means. So I decided to take a look at that in the context of Ecuador, uh, comparing different projects which self-profess to be collaborative. Uh, but before we move on to the results of a survey that I conducted, let's talk a little bit more about the theory behind LDNC and collaboration so that you can understand kind of where I'm coming from. So I'm sure you're all aware uh, of the division between fieldwork on, for, with, and by uh, speaker communities. That's a view from the 1990s, uh, helpful in theorizing uh, the approaches to fieldwork. And in line with that is a more recent decolonial approach, which professes that we should start with community needs in conceiving projects and in developing them. In line with that, uh, Tchaikovsky Higgins uh, talks about collaborative projects as uh, having two essential components. So goals of projects should be established jointly by researchers and speakers as equal partners. And both these parties should find the results of projects accessible and useful. What is also important here is the reciprocity in terms of learning. So not only do researchers train speakers, but also speakers train researchers, showing them the relevance of social norms and training them in how to be and how to behave in the local community context. So that's kind of one perspective giving um, a huge paper to the role of the community and the leadership of the community in such projects. And on the other hand, we also have literature which says that maybe articulating any one set of common features is not exactly uh, what we should be doing because there is too many contexts around the world of, uh, for projects of, uh, in language documentation. And in line with that, it has been proposed that maybe a true way of finding collaboration, which can be adapted to different contexts, is to redefine relationships from a model based on everybody trying to achieve the same thing and kind of agreeing on what this thing should be, uh, to people finding different uh, aspects of the project that they might want to carry out. And, uh, and these objectives being kind of equally important. Um, so this was the background. The goal of this talk is basically to explore how relationships are created within the context of projects which we say are collaborative and the case study here is Ecuador. How did I approach the topic? Well, the method was a survey that I created and sent out to researchers who have been working in Ecuador and I have to say that the these results that I will present today are just preliminary and that I am fully aware of the fact that uh, what I am talking about is basically only representing the point of view of researchers. So uh, I am fully aware of that and I'm just making a disclaimer. This is not meant to be something that's global. It's basically representing our own take on what it means for us to do collaborative work. So before talking about collaboration in more detail, I wanted to give you the summary of the survey results. First of all, just to put you in the context, Ecuador were the which is the focus of the study is here in North and South America. Uh, when we zoom into the country, here are all the languages uh, that the um, respondents to the survey have worked with. So as you can see from this orange shape here in the map on the right, uh, basically the survey managed to cover pretty much the whole territory, uh, well, most of the territory of Ecuador. So it's kind of fairly representative of what's going on in language documentation uh, research in the country. In terms of participants, I got 17 responses uh, to the survey covering over 20 projects from researchers working on very different career levels and in different countries and who have also been funded by multiple uh, funding bodies from ELDP through Fulbright to university funding for different projects and the time uh, period covered is the last 25 years basically. And in terms of disciplines, I said before, it's not only linguists who partook, there's also anthropologists, people who work in both disciplines and actually one visual anthropologist who was also working with language documentation. 
And now, uh, to just give you a context of, you know, what is kind of common in Ecuador uh, and the language endangerment situations, I've prepared this short overview of the most common scenarios in terms of language vitality, available materials, and the presence of orthography before the start of the projects, which uh, were described in the survey. So language vitality, um, overwhelming uh, majority of cases, either languages are vital or there is language shift in progress, but still languages are spoken by a substantial um, a part of the population. Uh, available materials, as you can see in none of the cases, uh, was it uh, that uh, there was no documentation at all prior to the start of the project. So most languages had dictionaries already, some had corpora, some had grammars, uh, there were journal articles and book chapters on them. Language teaching materials were also found quite often. And uh, then there was also a host of other kind of less uh, typical documentation materials. Uh, the fact that there are language teaching materials in quite a few cases is related to the fact that actually Ecuador has had a bilingual education in indigenous languages since 1980s. And related to that is also the fact that most of the languages uh, covered by the survey had multiple orthographies, either formal or informal with speakers using different ways of writing uh, on social media, for example. But in case for, for example, Quechuan languages, there have been multiple orthography reforms since the 1980s. And this shows because different segments of the population, different speakers use uh, different orthographies. So yeah, so much in terms of the context. And now let's move on to the main topic of this talk, which is collaboration. So interestingly, uh, the overwhelming majority of the people said that they were doing collaborative research. Three people said they weren't sure whether they were doing collaborative research, but that's not exactly because they were doing something differently. I think that's because they weren't exactly sure how I conceptualized collaboration or how it should be conceptualized to be real collaboration. And I didn't define that on purpose to see what we as researchers thought about that. Uh, the main kind of common features of projects that we find are the following. So we in Ecuador, researchers working on language documentation work with uh, teams of speakers. There was only one person who said they didn't do that. And we involve speakers in creation of uh, the corpora, so translation, transcription, fixing interviews, choosing topics for being recorded. In terms of overall goals of the project, there is a feeling that uh, academic requirements or funding body requires, uh, requirements actually restrict these goals. And only in a few cases, the overall project goals were actually um, agreed jointly with the community from the very start. Um, in terms of outcomes, we have the usual suspects such as grammars, dictionaries, corpora, but also in case of many projects, specific community, um, uh, community outcomes um, agreed on with the community. So there seems to be an even split in terms of what we produce. We produce both for ourselves and our academic careers and for the communities as well. And it does emerge from the data that we are not exactly sure how we should define collaboration on when should we say that this is okay, this is a truly collaborative project. We've kind of ticked all the boxes for collaboration. So I try to look more into that, asking more specific questions about what collaboration means in practice. And the first um, question that I ask is how the project originated, because in the literature on collaboration, there was an emphasis on creating the projects jointly. Uh, so we'll see how that worked out. Then decision making to see whether there is a equity in terms of how, how the different stakeholders participate in decision making, tasks carried out by native speaker team members, the training they've received, and extra linguistic positive outcomes of the project. Uh, that's another thing that I asked about. So let's look at all of them in turn. How did the project originate? Well, you can see that eight people said that they contacted communities with specific projects in mind. So that's not exactly doing things jointly. But then an equal measure of people actually uh, either designed the project with the community, did a mix of both these previous strategies, or were contacted by communities uh, to work with them, which is, you know, in terms of collaboration and equal distribution, that's uh, in theory, more in line with, uh, with how collaborative research should look like. And then there were also people who have been drawn into working in Ecuador for a chain of connections with other researchers. Now, in terms of decision-making, 
let me just move this a little bit up. So you can see I asked different Likert scale questions and um, asking researchers to rate on a scale from one to seven how joint the decision making process was. So one means the decision was made only by the researcher and seven means it was made by the whole team. And let's zoom into the different areas of decision making. So when we asked generally about uh, all the project uh, related decisions and how they were made, people respond in the middle. So not just by the researcher, not by the team as a whole. Uh, most answers are here, somewhere in the middle between the two. Now, when we move into more specific aspects of decision making, who decided where the project goals should be, you can see a different distribution here. Um, in one case, just the researcher. In most cases, some sort of middle ground between just the researcher and the research team. In terms of who should be recorded, we can see that the decision making is moving more towards the whole team. Uh, so the native speakers are more in charge of who a competent speaker is and who should be recorded on a given topic. And something similar is true for what kinds of data should be collected. So most of the projects actually included this documentation component of community cultural practices and linguistic practices, not just grammatical elicitation, for example. And this is reflected here, although um, it's interesting to see that there is five answers in five and five and seven and none in six. So that should probably be followed, uh, followed up in more detail in future, in future surveys or future research. And now moving on to the analysis of data, we can see that here the picture looks slightly different with most decision being made either by the researcher themselves or with slight collaboration uh, from the research team. And something similar is true when we, uh, when we think about archiving. Uh, so in terms of deciding where and how the data should be archived, most decisions were made by the researcher with small input from research team. But on the other end, we also have four projects, well actually five projects where these decisions were taken uh, jointly by the team to a greater extent. So we can see that it's necessary to look into decision making in more detail to kind of see how these decisions can really be fine grained and how different aspects of uh, community and researcher involvement are reflected on different uh, stages of the process. Now, in terms of the tasks carried out by native speakers, what we can see is that the team members were mostly involved in creating uh, the corpora. So data collection, acting as language consultants, transcription and translation. You will notice that I included grant writing here, but in none of the cases did the researchers say that the uh, community members were involved in that activity. And on the other side of the workflow, we've got archiving with only one project uh, where speakers were involved in archiving activities as well. And there is some activity in terms of dissemination of results, which shows a distribution of tasks with the speakers also beyond the completion of the corpus. And that's a, that's a hopeful trend, I think, uh, showing that researchers in Ecuador are trying to include speakers in more than just corpus creation, even though that's the prevalent activity at the moment. How does it work out in terms of training? So that's something similar and related to the previous slide. Uh, again, most of the training was focused on making the speakers competent in creating the corpus. So use of recording equipment, computer literacy, use of specialist software such as LAN, transcription, translation. To a lesser extent, editing of video and audio and uh, slightly greater conducting interviews, which is also related to data collection. And as many as 10 projects also train speakers in linguistic analysis. Uh, again, only two projects trained speakers in, uh, in archiving. So we see a clear prevalence of tasks related to creation of the corpus uh, at the moment of training speakers. Now, uh, this slide presents potential positive effects of full language documentation projects. And I should say that this is coming from the researcher's perspective. So this is not scientifically proven. This is just a kind of attitude check and see what researchers think that happened in the aftermath of the project. Uh, even so, the results are actually quite positive. So we can see that quite a few projects brought about improved language attitudes, increased interest in language and culture, increased confidence of speakers, um, involvement of uh, speakers who were related to the project in leadership, leadership roles, even though there was a 
kind of mutual relationship there because also people who were leaders in the community were often involved in such projects. And in some cases also speaker-led uh, documentation and revitalization projects. So this seems overwhelmingly positive and only in one case did the researchers say that the project didn't actually bring uh, anything of the, of the above. Right, so after looking at these practical aspects of what collaboration could mean, uh, let's try and summarize the findings. Um, first thing that I think um, comes across from the survey is that all of the projects that were included in the, in the survey could be classified as being conducted with the community um, on this continuum from on with, uh, well, yeah, on, for, with, and by. Uh, it seems that in case of all the projects, there was meaningful collaboration taking place and the dialogue between different stakeholders. So that's positive. And I think it's, it shows that there is collaboration going on. Uh, however, projects varied in terms of the extent to which speakers wanted to assume leadership. Some of them were geared towards speakers gradually becoming the main agents of documentation with the support from the speakers who were interested in that. And others, um, basically, uh, speakers were happy for the researcher to be there, but they didn't have much interest in conducting this kind of research independently by themselves later on. So we have different goals on behalf of, uh, of speakers as well. Uh, so I think the question that arises from them is whether it always makes sense to aspire to projects by the community as a necessary condition for truly meaningful collaboration. And the insights from the data um, are, well, I don't know if that's uh, very new to you, probably not, uh, that the requirements of academic careers and prerequisites of funding often push us as researchers to impose unilateral decision-making. Uh, this was particularly clear when we looked at uh, the goals of projects and how decisions were made in terms of, terms of archiving and the involvement of speakers in grant writing, which was virtually non-existent. And we all profess to engage in collaboration, but as you can see, it looks slightly different in different cases. And often we as researchers are not very sure how to define it. Now, what I think this Ecuadorian context tells us is that uh, collaboration in terms of language documentation seems to be satisfactory when the specific decisions are made by the most relevant stakeholders. So not everybody deciding on everything, but people deciding on things that are most relevant to them. So a linguist deciding on how to analyze a certain morpheme, but the community deciding on what kind of storybooks they want to have. And it seems that people are most satisfied with collaboration Again, this comes for now from the perspective of the researchers and how they see what's going on in their field, is when different stakeholders focus on the outcomes specific to them and basically make sure, sure that these outcomes are satisfactory rather than everybody being involved in everything and making all decisions uh, collaboratively. All right, so that's it for now. Uh, more will follow and I would want to write up the results of this research. So this was just the first snapshot. I welcome any of your comments. It would be great to hear what you think. And I wanted to acknowledge everyone who responded to the survey. You have the names of the researchers here and here are the references. Thank you very much.